Oh, I don't even have the. Um... Good morning. Ward, can you hear me? I'm only in a couple minutes. Yeah, I can hear you, Scott. Thanks. Okay. Okay, we're uh, we're just going to get started. Okay, just want to make sure that you were sitting on your deck in the sun and you could hear us. Yes, yes. that's exactly where I am. <laughs> I know. Mucho gracias. Dedicated. All right, uh, we're ready to go. So I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, the TNRD acknowledges that uh, we connect with many First Nation communities across our vast regional district, and today we're located on the Kamloops, the Shikwetmik territory situated within the unceded ancestral lands of the Shikwetmik Nation. The TNRD appreciates the partnership that we have with the Kamloops to Shikwetmik and respect the territory and land on which we are gathering today. Uh, so I'd like to, if I may, turn it over to our corporate officer, Ms. Campbell, to uh, uh, do the election um, for both committee chair and vice chair. Thank you. So as set out in the board procedure bylaw, we will carry out the election for chair and vice chair of the finance committee. Nominations will be called three times. As candidates are nominated, they will be asked if they consent to the nomination. Nominations will then be closed. If there's only one consenting candidate, that candidate will be acclaimed as the chair, vice chair. If there are two or more consenting candidates, each candidate will be given two minutes to say a few words if they wish before ballots are distributed. So I will now call for nominations for the position of chair of the finance committee. Director Bass, do you accept the nomination? Sure. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't remember my password to get into this thing, but yeah, sure. <laughs> Second, call for nominations for the Office of Chair of the Finance Committee. Third and final call for nominations for the Office of Chair. I declare the nominations closed. Director Bass has been acclaimed to the Office of Chair of the Finance Committee. Congratulations, Director Bass. Thank you. Could someone help me get back into <laughs> Sure. Thank you. It's for a two-year term. So all of our all of our standing committees are a two-year term. So we'll now call for nominations for the position of vice chair of the finance committee. Someone want to nominate someone. We need a vice chair. Director Grenier. <laughs> Director Laird, do you accept the nomination? Thank you. Second call for nominations for the Office of Vice Chair for the Finance Committee. Third and final call for nominations for the position of Vice Chair. Okay, I declare the nominations closed for the Office of Vice Chair. Uh, Director Laird has been acclaimed to the Office of Vice Chair for the Finance Committee. Congratulations to both of you. Um, so Chair Bass, would you like to go up to the, uh, yes, you know what? 
use mine and then David uh, David is coming to help you get in. You're the chair, but you do whatever you want. <laughs> Thank you Thank you for inviting me. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in a minute. We, uh, uh, oh, Chair Bass, is your microphone on? I'm sorry. Push so working here. Oh, I pushed it not hard enough. You see, I'm not awake yet. Um, <laughs> I'm still recovering. Um, I'm still recovering. Um, I pushed it not hard enough. You see, I'm not awake yet. I'm still recovering from Tuesday. Um, okay, thank you very much for um, electing David and I. I appreciate it. Um, we're moving on to minutes, 4.1. Um, draft minutes that are presented there with a recommendation. Anyone care to move? Moved by Director Grenier, seconded by Director Thorpe. Any opposed? Carried. Okay. Um, reports. Okie doke. Now we move on to Deanna, who's going to tell us what we've got ourselves into. Thank you, Chair Baz. I just thought I would take a few moments to go over um, the Finance Committee, a bit of background, um, how it became the Finance Committee, and what the role uh, is of the Finance Committee. So in terms of background, it was originally an audit uh, committee. So it was a very narrow function. Uh, the committee was only tasked with essentially uh, commenting on and reviewing the TNRD's annual audit, so the audit planning and the actual uh, final audit. And that committee was originally formed in 2004. And so feedback from directors over time was that uh, the TNRD would really benefit from a finance committee. And that also came out of recommendations from the forensic audit. The recommendations from the forensic audit centered around really expanding the scope of the audit committee to include looking at financial related matters at the TNRD. And we did a review of other local governments, including regional districts, and found that most other local governments actually do have a finance committee, some just a, solely a finance committee, some a combination of finance and something else, or finance and audit. So where we landed is a finance committee, which still has the audit function as well, but a much, um, much larger scope. And so the board supported the restructuring of the committee as a finance committee in 2022. So the mandate, uh, you'll have seen the terms of reference, and as you can see, it is a very large uh, mandate. Essentially, the role of the committee is to provide advice and make recommendations to the board regarding items related to financial policy, financial planning, and reporting, as well as reviewing and monitoring the TNRD's external audit and audit compliance. So what types of items will come to the committee? You will be busy. <laughs> so the annual audit planning and annual audit findings, you'll hear from BDO um, later today on the annual audit planning. Matters that have a financial impact on board priorities. So for example, if an initiative or a project comes up throughout the year that would have a significant impact on the uh, approved budget, it would come to this committee for consideration. Any financial policies, we do have a policy and governance committee that is tasked with looking at policies, but if the policy has a focus on finance, it would also come to this committee as well. Uh, asset management, so local governments are required to have asset management plans and we don't currently uh, have one that covers the entire organization, so this is going to be a really important priority of the TNRD going forward and matters related to asset management will come to this committee. Purchasing and procurement updates. We have a new uh, procurement and purchasing policy that was just put in place last year, but we plan to revisit every two years. So that will come to this committee sometime next year for review. And discussing and exploring opportunities to increase financial reporting and transparency. We have made a lot of changes and we put a lot of our financial reporting on our website now and we bring financial reports to the board and public meetings um, to increase our financial uh, reporting transparency, but there may be other ways that we can do that. So we'll look to this committee for um, suggestions and recommendations on that and any other financial or audit matters that get referred to this committee by the board. 
In terms of your rule, um, like all of our standing committees, the rule of the committee is, is as an advisory body uh, to the board. So you cannot make final decisions, only recommend to the board that a decision be made or something or a matter approved. And so the intent also is not to review or advise on internal financial functions or operations, but rather assist the board with fulfilling its mandate on financial matters at a governance level. In terms of staff support, our chief financial officer, Ms. Fox, is your, uh, your go-to for this committee, um, as well as the manager of finance uh, in their absence. So they're the liaison to this committee. And their role is to provide information, professional advice, and support the development of agenda items. Any questions? Thank you, uh, Director Laird. Oh. You know, I like the direction we're going with the with, with this particular um, committee. That uh, gives really this um, real opportunity to look and at the actual financing compared to just doing an audit. So I appreciate the amount of work you put into clarifying what our job is. Thank you. Anyone else? Director Grenier? Thank you, Chair. I have a number of questions and, and observations. I'm not quite sure whether this is the forum right now or because uh, I've got quite a few and I don't want to just blabber on. So is I guess that would depend on what the type of questions they are. Well, there's. And I take direction from Deanna and Carla. It does depend on the type of questions. All right. <laughs> well, let's let's stop me when you want to stop me. Then, um, it, number one, you're saying there's going to be a presentation by the uh, the auditor. Yes. Okay. So uh, and uh, so I'll have some questions of the auditor after they've made the presentation. Uh, I understand that there's been quite, uh, talking to previous directors, there's been quite an improvement in the financial information uh, that has come out, the structure. I've had the opportunity, as I know you have, I don't know if others have, to sit down on the specific area uh, with uh, Jamie and, and Carla, and thank you for that. I think that that was very enlightening and very helpful, and it's a process that helps us dive into and understand. Um, one of the things that has struck me through this process is, you know, I'm a new person. We're approving things right off the get-go, 600,000 of this and 300,000 of that. And that's our first meeting. And I'm thinking, boy, hang on a sec. Before we start spending all this dough, shouldn't we really understand what's going on? So the lead times ahead of finance and some of the things that we've been dealing with seems to me we as part of our process of, of restructuring, maybe we ought to um, uh, look at what we need to know and lead time. So for instance, we're dealing with almost a 6% a increase in our overall global budget number for TNRD. And we've essentially got two or three months uh, to deal with that. And I'm thinking, all right, if I was thinking about the next year, how would we deal with that? Would we just be dumped on our lap two or three months from now? Or would it be a proactive decision of this board to say to staff, to say to our taxpayers, to say to the hospital board and anybody else uh, orders and or grants and aid, our target budget is this for the coming year. And to set that out at a reasonable time ahead you know, based on whatever information we have, C CPI and whatever, but to say, this is what we're targeting. We're just consuming right now a 6% global, and that's going to have a, a 0 to 12% impact on your area. Next year, when can we start to say to people as a board, this is what our target is. As a board, we've decided we think it should be 4.5%, or we think it should be 3% based on something else. Wouldn't that be a good procedure to have? And I just want to ask Carla if that's a, if that's something that you would recommend. Chair Bass, if, if I could jump in, and then I know Carla. Hey, okay. Thank you um, to Director Grandy. This that's part of our presentation today. We've got a full schedule of exactly what our plan is. Um, so um, maybe perhaps it might make sense for Carla to actually run through her presentation because it may answer 
a lot of your questions, but we have a full schedule that takes you through month by month and how we plan on proceeding going forward from a, a financial standpoint. Thank you. I just wanted to add on to that. So this is not typical the way this process has worked. I mean, given the election and the start of our committees, typically the plant like, and also Ms. Fox is new to her role. So um, there would be this, this committee uh, would get information on budget planning well before um, the actual um, budget would be brought uh, to the board. So you'll see that going forward, and, and Ms. Fox will go over her schedule, that we do actually have a schedule for next year. It's just the timing of the election, the way the timing of committees um, were set out, that we don't we haven't had as much time to sort of bring that information um, ahead to get, although we did have the February Committee of the Whole um, meeting, which we normally wouldn't have done. But our hope, of course, is to be able to do some of this pre-planning and bring it to this committee well before um, earlier, earlier in the year. Can you see my hand up, Scott? Yeah, yeah we can now. Going on there. I did say Director Stamer, sorry, I, was, I have to push this harder. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, just to further uh, Director Grenier's uh, concerns, I mean, we already talked about an initial five-year budget, and I mean, there's a lot of information that we're going to be going over in a short period of time, but the reality is, I don't think a five or six percent increase is a surprise to anybody, and uh, we'll have more than enough time to be able to digest the information and be able to recommend it back to the board. I'm quite confident of being able to do that. Is that it, Director Steamer? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Anyone, anyone else with any questions? No? Okay, thank you. Then we'll move on to um, CFO Fox's presentation. Thank you very much. So we, with the board having the budget document presentation presented so soon um, after then we're meeting as the committee, we didn't want to give you another 205 page document within an agenda package. You guys were kind of familiar. We've been meeting with different directors and different um, municipalities, which has been, I think, really beneficial uh, just to get to know one another, uh, to understand, because I'm learning areas as well as names and faces and tying those to the budgets. And then uh, Jamie has been joining me in that just to really provide information uh, to all the questions, especially for new EAs um, and municipalities. So that process has been going very well. The next step, I'm gonna kind of talk about the process that we were following, the budget where it sits right now. The next piece of my presentation will be to give you a schedule that I've put together that kind of outlines kind of my thought of how, how we look at the budget process throughout an entire year from start to finish. So I'll go through that with you. I want to make sure that you guys are aware the budget that we brought had a global increase of the 5.68% of which I've had to explain on the radio as well. And that that's a little bit daunting because everybody thinks it's like a municipality and that percentage is going to impact your tax rate. And I have to explain that every different area has a different budget and a different percent. The questions have been great. I think there's lots of understanding coming forward through these presentations individually as to each area, the services, it's like a menu selection. Here's all the services you have. And then kind of layering in, look, you, you actually collect this amount from your area and that's broken down in classes and what those classes are and how the multiples work in that. Residents, utilities pay three, three and a half times more than residents. Just really trying to get an understanding of how everything is kind of being brought together to your tax bill that gets to you through the province and even how that is broken down. So that that process there, I think, as far as informing is something that I'd like to continue. And you'll see a step for that within the annual schedule to make sure we're keeping that link a little earlier on. Oh, thank you. Through the process. So. I just have this up only if there's pieces in here where you guys have maybe questions and you want to refer to to ask me a question. My intent today is to say of each of the budgets that were presented, services that were presented, I took a, 
a different approach based on some feedback I received, um, one directly from Director Stamer, I think, in regards to uh, presenting more so on the EA municipal level rather than the TNRD as a whole. So started out just by saying, okay, here's the general increase, here's our departments. Here's what's changing in each of those departments. Here's some of the factors that we brought in as far as CPI and inflation and a bit of our strategy. That's all a lot to take in right when you're just elected. Completely get that. Timing wasn't really on our side this year, but we still tried to make that attempt. What we're hoping to gather from you guys as a committee, did you feel that process was a good process? Um, I think what I'm hearing is most of the people that were on the board before um, did seem to get a lot out of that process and and the was it enough time? Was the, the half a day session enough time? What you'll see in the, the reporting schedule is what I will suggest a little bit differently going in. We'll obviously meet sooner, but I'd like to have departmental presentations so that, and, and we kind of did that with orientation. So we had that a bit, but but kind of build that into the process where each of the departments is kind of giving you a, a presentation on their status for the year, what might be changing, and then you kind of get a sense when we bring the budget and break those into two different presentations. So we kind of had that this year where you got a little kind of introduction to what each of the departments does, but it was less focused on dollars involved. So we might bring that piece into it a little bit more. So essentially, services are set by the board. We understand what services we have to deliver. We know consistently year over year, we're delivering those services with a certain level of resources and cost. Those year over year, things don't change. So your strategic planning will play a role in what we do for 2024. So with the budget that was put in front of you, this last presentation of how we brought it forward. Is there any comments that you would like to make at this point in time on how that went, what you would maybe like to see differently? And it, it's a little bit disjointed because I will get into a budget schedule that tells you kind of timing of things. So maybe questions less about timing and more about the documents or process that you're see that you're seeing. And yeah, anyway, I'll just, I'm going to leave it at that because I could ramble on forever. I don't want to inundate you with all the information that you were told during budget already. Um, but I want to give the committee an opportunity to comment on the tax rate as it sits. If you're happy with the process, if there's anything you would like to see change in that process of delivering the document to you. Director Grenier. Thank you. Um, Things that I found really useful as a new director was that chart that showed us where we were on our expenditures and where we were on the budget. And the reason why that's a useful thing is we're not just comparing one year against another year, but we've got some sort of, uh, as Ward said, uh, five year plan, an extended period that we can see what trends are coming at us and, and where we're at. So I found that particular chart useful. And as we know, sometimes charts are so much more effective in communicating than just a series of numbers. And I think for people that don't have, directors that don't have a financial background, that really hits you right in the head and says, look, we're below the line, uh, we're heading towards the line, that's why you got an increase And in it. So that is some feedback on that. One of the things that I heard over again from the previous directors was that there was much more um, information it was it was better assembled in the past one of the things that i would like to see is the breakout of operational costs from capital costs and i know that you have you've said that this was one of the things that you were going to work on um you just got on the job and you were going to do that and i think it's important and i'll say why it's important um it's important because when we are faced with these rather large increases um there are things as directors that we might be able to do in terms of the capital expenditure program that will then reflect on the operational costs. So if we're delaying a capital project, uh, uh, that might have repercussions on operational costs and that would have repercussions on the tax increases and so on and so forth. 
So as directors, we're directors. We're not you and we're not the staff and we're not the ones we're authorizing expenditures. And I think that that's an important part of our job is to understand what's operational costs and what is somewhat discretionary capital costs. The other comment that I'll have that, that I was struggling with, um, we have this notion of surplus and reserve and, and Director Stamer uh, informed me and, and, and CAO Hildebrand informed me that um, surpluses get brought into the revenue stream in the next year. And, and, and so, I, and, and apparently that's by legislation. And then uh, CEO Hildebrand said that uh, there are ways that it can go into the reserve. And so I'm thinking about this from my business practice, and uh, we obviously had a little more flexibility than, than, than that. But going to a strata corporation, which I think I, Director Laird, you're familiar with, any kind of surplus that you have, uh, at uh, the, 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 the project manager is going to go back to the strata board and say, now we have the surplus. Do you want to keep it in operational or do you want to put it into your contingency? And, uh, and that important step is connecting the, that uh, strata board with that surplus. And the presentation that you gave us, you had applied the surplus already. And maybe because it was mandated and legislated, it might be my ignorance, but seems to me that a budget should be developed based on its cost. And then you tell the people what the surplus is and you ask them for their approval, either to surplus or to contingency. The other reason why that's important is that the people carrying the budget the next year aren't building in uh, a, a surplus, a, a chronic surplus. <laughs> and, and I think it's important for the directors who are authorizing these expenditures to understand whether there's a, you know, whether they perceive a baked in surplus or whether it's just truly the operational cost. So it's a, it's a transparency thing. I'm not suggesting that somebody's trying to pull a fast one on anybody, but uh, it, it, it just strikes me as an important part of our decision-making process to decide when the surpluses get applied or to whether they go into um, uh, a contingency type format or future expenditures. I'll stop right there because uh, that's a lot. <laughs> so we'll go to CFO Fox to answer and then we have Director Stamer next. Excellent. Thank you. So yeah, the operational capital split out is something that I identified right off the hop. And when I'm presenting to the board, what I'd like to be able to show you is this service year over year is consistent. And you can see the operational cost consistent year over year. Right now, if they have large capital in there, it's like up and down. And I can't show you that very well. There's a lot of data that I've got to put out and try and show you and have you trust the numbers that are being built in there that's one way of doing it because then you just see a little bit of inflation some wage increases and you'll see that just go up trickle up a little bit year over year the the extent of work that that's going to require uh is going to be throughout this year so one thing uh to mention is right now there was three senior leaders in finance there's just me right now, and I'm looking at filling the finance manager vacancy very soon. Uh, once that's there, that's going to give me some time to focus on the capital plan, asset management, and reserve strategy, and work on creating a system. Because it's not a matter of just pulling out the numbers. It's literally having to go into the financial system and create a new section uh, for capital and capital revenue. So that's that's very separate. So just it's taking a little bit of extra time. It's it's where we're striving to get to uh, for the benefit of us and also for the benefit of the board's understanding. There are, in my past lives, uh, previous to here, I'm very used to presenting capital and operational separately in two separate sessions. Uh, it's beneficial because it can get overwhelming. It's a lot. Uh, we have a challenge of trying to present a lot of information uh, in a very short period of time. So that'll bring me to the surplus reserve uh, uh, comment there. Right now, I don't have the two sessions in my schedule broken out, but when we get to the schedule, I think that would be a very, if 
if the board is willing to entertain two special meetings separate, um, I think that would be beneficial, especially this year being new at going through the capital plan and trying to understand that and having a funding strategy for that. So I think that that will help a lot. The surplus and reserve challenge. The surpluses is something that I had to learn about for, for the TNRD. Um, it's regional districts uh, operate a lot more with surpluses because in every separate service, you have to keep the surpluses separate and it has to be carried forward because if you taxed and you have more money left at the end of the year, you have to bring that back and, and benefit the taxpayer in the next year. So essentially, taxes are less because you have a surplus. It is a, a problem right now in trying to bring that amount of work to the board prior to to get input on how the board would like to see that. Now, first off, we meet with directors to give information. We are not really supposed to be meeting with directors to take direction on what to do with numbers. So that's a decision as the board of a, as a whole. So meeting with the directors, I think, gives the opportunity to bring up suggestions that we can then bring to the board and look for uh, uh, approval on any direction that we're trying to take. It's a bit tricky because what's happening in Director Grenier's area isn't necessarily what's happening in Director Laird's area. So now I'm looking for approval on something that a majority of the board doesn't really have a say or understanding of. So it just gets a little bit tricky in the dynamics of that. This year, uh, the focus was status quo. <laughs> if, it, if it wasn't broken, there's so many line items there. I didn't work to change too much of the process because I just wanted to be able to bring you something that I knew balanced and was reasonable and we could trust. So that was my focus this year. Uh, there is definitely room to talk more about the surpluses, especially if you're aware of it. And in the schedule, we have a earlier timeline set out to meet with directors going into budget deliberation and also with the finance committee. But as you can imagine with 144 services, I have a surplus in every one of those accounts. And if you want a say on every single surplus that we're dealing with, that's a lot of time you're asking me to dedicate to work with each director. So we, ways of getting around that type of thing, or when you set up a service establishment, or when you set up a reserve bylaw, you can set up policies and bylaws that say, if there's surplus, I want 80% of that surplus to go into reserve. So that way you're just setting a policy that's broad for a, a service area. Any services within area J, we want 80% of the surplus put into reserve, or maybe it's not as broad as that, you have to go by service. but just to kind of give you an idea of things that would help for direction so that I'm not looking for input on a, on all those services. Again, that, that was long-winded as well, so I'll stop there. <laughs> and uh, just to give you an idea and, and hopefully answered your questions there. So we'll um, go back to Director Grenier for a comment on the answer, then we're going to Director Stamer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, that was great. Thank you for that explanation. I would suggest that the default is that it goes to the reserve and you do a broad one, like every line item that all that goes into automatically into the reserve. And then a schedule that says your recommendation to the board to apply in a particular like whatever the category is. So you've got 85 categories in 85, you'll either recommend some of it coming out of that reserve to the surplus. So it's a recommendation by staff how to apply the surplus that is there for each of the line items so that we're not faced with 85 separate decisions, but we but there's a default that goes into the reserve instead of into the operational budget and then a recommended report that says this is how we would, would recommend withdrawing it. That way we get to see it and we get to consider the repercussions of that as a global one. That would be my suggestion, and there may be better ones, but that's my suggestion on that issue. Thank you, Director Grenier. Uh, we have Director Steamer and then Director Laird. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I mean, we could really, this, this meeting could be six hours long if we really wanted it to be when you start talking about individual budgets. But I think uh, Ms. Fox is certainly on the right track when we're trying to uh, not necessarily simplify, but, uh, you know, give us a, give us a, 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 I'm thinking of a proper word for it, a condensed version of some of the information in as much as that we all want to be able to try to, you know, maintain the budgets and have, and have a surplus and then determining what we're going to be doing with it. And we also want to be able to make sure that we have it separate between operating and, so, and some of the capital expenditures that are going to be coming down the road, because that's really going to hit us, uh, you know, in the, in the future when we start looking at some of these new builds. So I'm, I'm thankful to, to uh, Ms. Fox and her staff to even try to, you know, appreciate that in the past, some of this information was so convoluted and basically baffling you with the you know what, that it was very hard to explain and try to even understand exactly where we were at any given time. Hopefully we can get to the point where people are comfortable in knowing that this is where our operating numbers are, this is where our capital expenses are, this is where our asset management lies, and we can see where, where we sit and have enough of a head, head, heads up in November, December and say, yeah, it looks like we're going to have a significant surplus in this area. Now we can apply that as a group or whatever we do so that come January, you have a pretty good idea of where that tax increase is going to be instead of having to sort of chase around the way we are right now, because I'm sure it's got to be tough on the finance uh, department trying to put all that information together. So I appreciate for all the work that they put in so far. And if we can condense a lot of this information for the rest of the board, it'll give them a better idea to be able to stick handle through it because otherwise it's going to be a daunting task. Thank you. Thank you. Director Laird. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had a question. When we go into our strategic planning, I think it's in March. And if we have um, some new items come out of that, how do we go about putting that into a 2023 budget? Oh, CFO Fox. Uh, thank you. So I, I really appreciate the question because lots of times uh, strategic planning is seen very separate from budget and it should not be. So what should come out of strategic planning? And from what I've seen in the past, there's an action plan that comes out of there. And what we should do before we can commit we go through all the, the action items that come out of strategic planning, and we kind of come up with how the TNRD is going to meet your action items. Part of that is, does it need further resources? Does it need money towards it to get it done? Is it something we can do in-house? So we have to kind of analyze that as we're going through these action items and decide. And then if it does require further investment as far as resources or contracting out or, or different things like that, we need to bring that back through budgeting to make sure that you're aware that if you're going to, if we want to go down this path, this is going to impact our budget in this way. So we need to tie it together. And maybe it's just a more intentional conversation that says, okay, your strategic initiatives have been incorporated in, into the budget, the ones that had implications, here's where they are and, and give you a little snippet of what that is. But that would be that would be something that I would be used to seeing. Um, and it's just, I think uh, Mr. Hildebrandt and I are on the same page. We've had some discussion broadly uh, with the, the general management team just about how to, how to work that, especially when it comes to communication plans and annual reporting plans. Hopefully that answers your question. CEO Hildebrandt. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and just to follow up on that as well. So bringing things like a capital strategy to the strategic planning session and, and making sure that the board understands that we have a high level strategy for capital planning and reserve planning and all those things that can be laid out there, but it's staff that will go back and figure out operationally how we do that. But those ideas and those discussions certainly need to be happening at the strategic planning session as well. Thank you. Did I see your hand again, Director Crenier? Thank you. This is a new item, uh, Chair. Thank sure. you. Um, uh, in the short time I've been here, I've been dealing with uh, some rather large grant and aid requests for our area. I cross-reference those grant and aid requests to the bylaw that authorizes it. And I see in one particular instance that there was no timeline on when that grant and aid would, uh, would end or any review period. Uh, I didn't even see anything that said that the 
recipient of the grant and aid had to be in good financial standing or file audited statements or anything along those lines. And I think when we're dealing with large capital items, we should be uh, ensuring that the bylaws that enact those things have some standard things like a review process, maybe even say that any grant and aid wouldn't be any longer than a five-year period or a three-year period, which would force a review. And I think, uh, so there's, what we're talking about is not just the, the expenditure of the money, but also the bylaw that, uh, that enacts that expenditure. Thank you. CEO Hildebrand. Um, Director Gagne, can you ex which bylaw are you referring to? Because we're, we're not sure what grant are you referring to? The, the one that we've been oh, dealing okay. with that I'd rather not talk oh, about. Oh, I'm sorry. Identify oh, yeah. specifically, but it said to me, if there are other bylaws or grant aids like that, then maybe we need to review all of our grant aids, because this was an older one, and to determine whether we have other ones like that. That one is, is certainly standalone and certainly needs some work, but the other ones that will come back to the board certainly have process and procedure and all that vetting and check checklists associated with them. Yeah. Manager Campbell. Thank you. Just, just to provide some clarity, that is a unique one. So in the legislation, um, services are around economic development or promoting tourism, those have to be, grant and aids, those have to be in a bylaw. So the gold country, um, if that's the one you're referring to, that is in a bylaw. Our other grant and aid fundings are not in bylaws. So there's a process, they're in a policy, there's a process to apply, and there's requirements that they be a registered society, that they be in good standing, that they provide us with their financials. So that one's a bit of a, a unique, um, wow. unique arrangement, basically, yeah. CFO Fox. There is a number of items going to be coming back to the committee and board just in regards to discretionary uh, grant need, um, the economic development piece. And we've kind of highlighted that through our discussions. Uh, you'll see right now that the taxation required for economic development right now is zero. Economic development for 2023, the dollars that are there is uh, are being funded right now from surplus fund carry forwards and then economic development from 24 to 27 are there's no dollars uh, appropriated there right now and that's because for those exact reasons we're looking for a bylaw and policy to give uh, better direction around those funds and the involvement of the board in economic development so I think we we've kind of highlighted uh, a few areas like gas tax um, economic development, grant need fund that has to come back just for discussion to the board so we get better direction on that. But the discretionary grant that we have right now does have a policy and it does ask that you're in good standing and, and there is some there is some parameters that they have to meet within them. Thank you. Any any other questions from any direct, director Grenier? Thank you, Chair. Um, it struck me in reviewing the 205 pages that a lot of the application of these things seem to be either uh, shared among areas, the 10 areas, or it was uh, um, uh, it was based on uh, an assessed value. And I started to think we've got areas within the TNRD that are growing much more rapidly. And uh, is that the only metric that would be appropriate to apply to uh, the shared expenses. Uh, and I asked the fellow that was sitting beside you in the last meeting, who was your consultant, is there, are there other metrics, for instance, population? Uh, is it, you know, we have 10 EAs, so would it be one-tenth of the EA budget? Are there other metrics that we are legally allowed to apply and that might have a better reference? And I'll use a silly example, mosquito. We have a mosquito budget. Mosquitoes don't bite assessed homes, they bite individuals. Population might be an, a, more, a more appropriate, I'm just suggesting, maybe it's a more appropriate metric when we're looking at something like a mosquito bylaw as opposed to an assessment value because if it was just area J in the city of Kamloops, there's 99,000 people in the city of Kamloops to bite, there's 2,000 people in area J to bite, how would you apply that mosquito bylaw? And that might be one of the metrics available to us to look at. So I just, I guess I'm saying if there's other metrics, maybe you could bring that to our attention. 
uh, in application of some of these common expenditures. Thank CFO you. Fox. Hi, through to Director Grenier. So I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure if I'm on the mark with this, but all services are set up within a, a service establishment bylaw, and within that bylaw, it dictates how you can charge fees or taxation under there. And I believe in there, it's also approved through the province how you're going to collect. Uh, and a majority of times they're using assessment values to determine or sp split that out uh, among the participating areas. I'm just wondering if it's during that time where I think you would have to look. Um, I haven't been involved in one at this point. I think we have to do, I'd, I personally have to do a little bit more work, but I'll turn to my my teammates here to see if if they know but as far as i'm aware that's the the mechanism that's been used at this point i'm not sure if there's ones that have population uh used but uh it's something i certainly could could get back to you on if there if there was if a talk to the province um we also have another um staff member here that's much more involved in that and i could get her feedback on it but that is the time I guess that would be my point is that's the time to talk about how the service is being charged. So whoever yeah. wants to reply. So um, we are we are limited in how the service um, is charged. It's set out in the legislation. The options for um, recovering um, the funding is is set out in the legislation. So we're restricted to that and we identify uh, which method in the bylaw. Um, so the population is not one of is not one of them. Anyone else with questions? Director Stamer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I just wanted thanks to Director Jet Grenier, but I just wanted to point out that sometimes it's not black and white when we come, when we look at some of these services, uh, even with the mosquito situation, depending on the location and things like that. Uh, you know, sometimes you have to spray twice because of water level, some places you don't. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of nuts and bolts that we could spend an awful lot of time talking about right now uh, because everything is different in different regions. But uh, I appreciate the appreciate the question. Thank you. Anyone else? CFO Fox. So seeing that there weren't um, more questions there, I just thought I'd wrap this one up and then I can move on to the budget schedule. Um, not saying that there, there couldn't be more questions, but the the discussion there really i wanted to focus on the process what you guys saw i've got some really great feedback uh things that i think will be really beneficial to us moving forward uh the one comment i would make is in regards to asset management asset management part of that is a capital plan uh, there's so many pieces of asset management that we so i'm going to focus on the capital plan and a reserve strategy from the finance perspective, just to tie into the tangible capital assets that we're responsible for. We are working in other departments on growth and development, uh, trying to think of all the, the different layers, even with the GIS department and gathering uh, data around where our assets are and what condition they're in. We have little pieces of that going on all over. So that is a conversation that we do need to bring back to you. I just wanted to point out that the capital planning portion of that is a, is a portion of asset management, um, both of which really need to be focused on moving forward. And other than that, I have no new information to add to that just to kind of move into the schedule. But any changes coming up from the budget in our next version of the budget coming back in March are going to incorporate some of the suggestions coming forward uh, from the, the directors, but I have no significant uh, changes at this time. Most of the impacts are from year end, year end results, meaning our surplus estimates were different than what, what we had. Uh, discretionary funds were expended, so we don't actually have surplus to bring forward those are the ones that i'm seeing right now but th those are the major impacts right now so there's nothing significantly changing other than the things we don't really have control on oh sorry and good point we don't have the the revised assessment rule which comes in march 
So it's pretty quick turnaround. We get that assessment rule, update those numbers, and then we have to analyze the results, the changes in there and bring that back to you. But it does have to be, the five-year plan does have to be approved by March 31st. Director Laird. CFO Fox. Yes, absolutely. And we we report on our asset management metrics, but as far as the stages that we need to be at, I'd like to see us at a, a further stage than we're at right now. So that's just going to take some focus. We've we've been turning over and had different focuses over the last few years. So now, now that we're we're pretty strong foundation and a really great team to work with, we're really gonna start to focus our efforts on that. Manager Campbell. Thank you. I'm gonna actually turn it over to Jamie with respect to Director Grenier's earlier question about the grant and aid bylaw. I misspoke. Um, so the, the Gold Country grant and aid is unique in that it's specific to economic development and tourism, which is a, a section outlined in the legislation. So it's a certain process in terms of being able to make that financial contribution. But Mr. Vieira has pointed out that we actually do have some other cultural and recreation uh, grant and aid bylaws, which I was not aware of. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Ms. Campbell. Uh, so the just for for clarity, the grant and aids that we have um, are most of the other ones. Yeah, relate to community halls, community parks, where we're funding uh, external nonprofit agencies that own the asset and control the asset. So um, to Director Grenier's question or comment around accountability, um, we've actually identified that as something that we need to review this year to make sure that we have agreements in place regarding that funding with each organization. So the bylaw under the service establishment um, uh, really just pertains to the regional district authority to tax for that service. Um, what we need to review and make sure we have in place is more um, detailed agreements with the agency receiving the funding, which I think you're getting at around reporting and accountability requirements. So um, uh, yeah, I understand your question and concern, and that's actually something we've identified to, to work on this year. I know some of them are in place and some of them where we have gaps that we need to fill in. Director Stamer. Uh, yes, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I agree with uh, what uh, Ms. Fox was saying. You know, when we try to get ahead of some of this stuff, when we're looking at, you know, a breakdown on our operating costs and increase in surpluses, uh, capital assets, reserves, any of the plan building stuff, and that all wraps up back into the, just looking at the the, the list here of the reporting schedule on uh, May and June for the strategic planning. Is that when we're looking at bringing that together with the entire board is in May and June? Is that is that the strategic planning or is that earlier than that? Anyone? He knows when to leave. Director Sam, are you referring to the, the annual reporting and budget schedule that, that Ms. Fox shared? Yeah, I'm just looking at, yeah, thanks. I'm just looking at that. Like, I'm, I'm you know, I, we're trying to get ahead of some of this oh, yeah. information. And and uh, I'm just wondering, when is when is our strategic planning uh, meetings or me meeting or meetings going to be held? Is that March or April? Or is it actually going to be later mm -hmm. than that? It, it, we, we would actually probably look at earlier. Typically, it's in January for most local governments. And, and the, the reasoning behind that is because we're working on budget around that time. And then the budget is approved in March. Um, mm -hmm. So this is just a draft. Um, so we can we can revisit that. But yes, it would it would more it would actually be January would, would be the ideal time to have the strategic planning session. OK, thank you. CFO Fox. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I was caught off guard there. I, I didn't realize that this was up on the screen already, and uh, I was trying to pull my thoughts together there. I That's my fault on the schedule. I tried to capture when we were having it this year, and I didn't go back and change the date afterwards, because I think, uh, Mr. Hildebrandt, you're targeting strategic planning in March for this year, and then Uh, we usually do a one strategic plan for the term. So we're doing that in March and that'll give us the high level kind of focus areas. 
which then could slightly change, you know, year over year, but it would be within those key fo focus areas. Thank you. So I just wanted to double check that it's okay to move into going through the draft schedule. Director Stammer, your hand's still up. Do you have another question? Sure. No, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you. Sure, go ahead. So I find it helpful just to have a schedule that we kind of endorse together as the committee and it's kind of our commitment to the to the board to follow a schedule. Now, please, this is really a working draft and I gave it to my teammates very shortly before I gave it to you. So we may find things in here that that aren't perfect or even my, my team, like the strategic planning hasn't uh, pointed out I put in the wrong date here yet. So I just wanted to point that out. We are really working on with communications with public consultation so the survey that's going out through communications right now is kind of our first opportunity to just talk about broad services, remembering that it's really interesting to try and do public consultation for a budget like this, because we have a really large area and we're trying to consult. So it's like, oh, would we go into every community and try and do some sort of, of uh, public consultation? Are we trying to do it broad? Uh, that's certainly a conversation for this committee if they want to see something different. Remember this year, uh, it's not as strategic or proactively planned out as we would have liked because we're obviously coming into budgeting uh, and these conversations a little later than, than we would be normally. So right now, there's a public engagement survey going out. I've included the strategic planning on this uh, financial schedule, let's say, because I like just to show that the two tie together, I, I'm not setting up the strategic planning, that's not my department, but we are linked and it's just a reminder how that plays into the budget. So I think Director Laird, that, that'd be helpful just showing, we do strategic planning, we do consulting, public consultation before that, and we also do public engagement, or we're trying to do public engagement before budget. It's a little bit more number specific. So you'll see that on the schedule. So we have February uh, this year, we're doing a public engagement survey. We have February today, we're meeting with the finance committee. Over uh, the next month, I'm working on bringing the year end to that final budget and everybody's recommendations so that you'll get to, uh, the adoption of the five-year financial plan. The little piece in between there is that if there is any new reserve contributions, that have been requested to go into a capital reserve that hasn't been established, I have to bring forward a bylaw. We can't just put money in a capital reserve that has no bylaw. So there are a few new requests. So you would be seeing uh, capital reserve bylaws coming forward to support the five-year plan that's been brought forward. Then we have the strategic planning session uh, that's in March as well. The other thing I did not have time to do is correspond the finance committee meeting dates to this schedule. Uh, so I've thrown the meetings in here, but as I was preparing this this morning, uh, I didn't uh, cross reference to the finance meeting. So I'll, I'll have the correct finance meeting dates in here as well for the committee. And then usually starting in the summer, that's when we start getting into a bit more of our budget talks. Uh, it's this is where I think uh, Director Grenier having our initial conversation about what the finance committee would like to see uh, as we're developing the budget. We can have a brief conversation about taxes and what we think the economy is doing and what we're expecting going forward, just at a broad conversation so that when we're bringing uh, the budget together, we're taking those things into consideration. We're also taking into consideration the strategic planning action items and anything new that's come up through the, the year, maybe through strategic planning, there's a new service or the removal of a service. So we have to take those things into consideration. I plan on through the summer working on that long-term capital planning and pulling together the long-term plan and building a finance strategy, uh, a reserve funding strategy and a funding strategy for the capital. Uh, through that time. And then in September is when staff really starts to pull together and go through the five-year plan. 
and the next year, so 2024, and review those numbers and bring that forward. Thank goodness I've been able to create a template that everybody is consistently using across the organization for their five-year plan for each department. And it's mirrored now into an overall budget tax calculation document. So I'm not hand keying entries in. Uh, it's way less time consuming that part of the process. So I am looking forward to that and everybody using a consistent budget template. That was a big step for us. And we've changed some processes internally. So people are much more responsible for their numbers and the outcomes of those numbers. And I've set up kind of time timelines throughout the year with staff to do quarterly financial budget variance reviews, try and build that in more consistently. So they, they're very familiar with where they're sitting throughout the year rather than us waiting till year end. So those are some of the things that I'm doing to make sure that you guys are confident in what we're bringing forward to you. Uh, that's September, as we're working through that, looking at the service levels, the five-year projection, the public consultation uh, somewhere in September, October uh, to give feedback to the board, because really the, the public consultation, public engagement is so that the public can give you feedback so you can influence what you want to bring forward. Other than that, we follow the bylaws and policies that dictate what our services are and how to deliver them. So that's your opportunity. I think sometimes people think the public engagement is for the staff. It is not. It's definitely for the board. And it's important for us to have that discussion with you on how you would like to see that occur. We just have a little bit more uh, complex situation here. Uh, I see a hand up. So rather than continue through the rest of this, maybe I'll go to the question and then I can continue after that. Director Stamer, then Director Grenier. Your hand, what your hand was up. Is it no longer up, Director Stamer? Okay, Director Grenier. Thank you, Chair. Um, really glad to hear about that common template that's going across to all the departments. And as a newbie director, we could use a template. And that template would say in the four year term that you've got, uh, can you give us a kind of heads up on what it is that you are trying to do to help us organize, but also to explain to staff? Because I'm sitting down with staff and I'm saying, boy, oh boy, I want to do this. I want to do that. And then I'm being read the riot act about, well, here's how it goes about and all the rest of it. So something that takes those two processes uh, and helps inform on a budgeting. Well, if you did this, if you wanted a community hall in the north and you wanted a community hall at Cherry Creek, then here's where the capital is and here's how it might fit in and here's what the process is. That'd be really useful to me um, as a new director. Thank you. Did you want to reply CFO Fox or should I move on to Director Stamer? I'll rep reply really quickly. I think um, a template somewhat maybe could be developed. I'd, I'd have to get into further conversation to understand that a little bit more. But what I would say is that for sure your strategic planning session for new ideas, new services, service changes, you need to have that conversation with your board and action recommendations that come out of the board are direction to us to act or look into or research. So directing that kind of work. So that definitely is the place for those kind of new ideas. And then initiatives, certainly having conversation with CAO Hildebrandt uh, about any initiatives that you're unsure of. Um, and and he would he direct you in, in the right way, I think, with those things. Director Stamer. Okay, I'm confused, Director Stamer. Your hand's going up and then not up. So did you have anything to say, ask? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. No, no, no. No, no, no. Okay, thank you very much. Um, moving on, we are at... Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, sorry for that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to quickly add, um, Director Grenier is right. But I think when we talk about some of the condensing and, and, and some of the information, I think it is very important, particularly for some of the new the new members 
if um, if um, CFO Fox is going to be doing quarterly reviews, I think that's a really good opportunity either from a staff level or a, or a report from the finance committee on you know how things are going because you know as every every area is different, every municipality is different. But it sounds to me like um, Ms. Fox is trying to get a handle on some of that information that was spread out all over the place and she's condensing it into those compartments and it's so much easier to keep track of. And I think it'll make going forward, if anybody has a specific question, either off camera or on camera, it'll be so much easier for her to be able to explain it in layman's language than having to spend 15 minutes trying to get the information because it's buried in, in the information that it was in the past. So I'm looking forward to that very much. Thank you. Thank you, CFO Fox. Turned it off. So uh, yeah, I, I jumped over. I do have right now a commitment for a, a half year financial report and status. And I didn't do quarterly to the board because I got to make sure I can meet the commitment with the staffing that I have. So I've committed right now to a half year. You guys would see year end results through audit, um, but a half year current uh, would be great to be able to bring you. And then quarterly with the staff and then if I can meet a further commitment of that right now trying to pull that information together for you guys on that um quarterly commitment I'm I haven't I haven't committed to you just yet but uh definitely see the benefit in bringing you guys that information did you want me to just continue finish off going through the the latter part of the schedule here yes please okay so uh the October 23 is when I've kind of slated in. Maybe we'll try and bring you that departmental look or departmental conversation. And October, uh, later in October, have the finance committee have that preliminary uh, discussion about what the draft is looking like and coming together. Oh. Yeah. oh. <laughs> and then... We're basically at that point having a developing that draft budget, that draft one to come forward. Then I see October is really staff working together and November as the board kind of working together uh, to bring those pieces together. Look at the results from the public consultation, kind of the last look at what we want to influence uh, to bring to the board as a whole in December. Right now, I haven't got on here whether that would be a provisional budget. So we've done a provisional budget and five-year plan that has actually developed an entire financial bylaw, which we can do, um, but I'm giving you a five-year financial plan provisionally to adopt in December. That is a lot of work and it's gonna change. Um, or we continue on with a draft or we just continue on on the basis that the, the second year, so the five-year plan for 2023, the second year is 2024. And we just say that guides the spending until we adopt another budget. But I think we'll have to have further discussion on what you guys would like to see at that stage. So it's either a draft or a provisional. Draft just meaning that it's not adopted or approved. A provisional is actually a provisionally approved financial plan. And then jumping into... Uh, I did work in a piece here that uh, Mario will talk about as well is this compliance audit. So through the BDO uh, forensic audit, there was a recommendation for uh, the compliance audit. So we're going to bring that into this conversation today. Uh, there has been some money put in the budget is that if that's what the board wants to do, it's there to move forward. And then the year-end audit is when the staff is really bringing in those year-end components into the, the guest draft two or the final budget, uh, waiting for those assessment, uh, BC assessment information to come in to incorporate into the budget. That will really give you an idea of those tax implications. So we'll have to have another discussion as a finance committee as to what how that affected the budget and then bring the, the budget forward, the five-year plan for adoption in March as we're doing this year. And then it just all starts over again. And obviously we'll debrief to decide if the process that we followed needs to be tweaked. Uh, it's not set in stone. If we decide we need another step or stage in there, we'll just revisit it when we, we meet as a finance committee. 
So hopefully, sorry, that was, I wanted to go through that just so you had an idea of what I was thinking. Hopefully that seems to meet the your needs and it's not like it's it's closed conversation. It can adjust to, to the needs of the board. I will leave it at that. Thank you, Chair Bass. Thank you. Any questions on that? Director Laird. I just have um, some concerns around um, the input coming from the public. I haven't seen the questionnaire that's going out yet, but what I've found over the years, um, most people just get lost when you send them out of financial, any sort of financial information. And I don't know whether it's an opportunity for the directors to actually have uh, a meeting in their community to have them come, people come down and, and you can actually present the questions and hear their answers. And it's a lot more meaningful for me as a director to hear directly from my constituents is how they're feeling about our budget and where we're going than trying to send out a questionnaire that uh, very few people even have enough information to answer. CEO Hildebrand. Uh, thank you, Chair Bass and to Director Laird. That's exactly our goal uh, going forward this year, as you know, with election and everything going on. We hadn't had that opportunity to do that, but we'd like to meet in communities. We'd like to share information. This survey <clears throat> isn't going to be a flurry of numbers. It'll be more high level about direction of services and taxation. Uh, it went out yesterday, and I'll be speaking to that uh, a bit more during our board meeting this afternoon. Um, but that is our intention to be out in the communities, getting feedback directly face to face uh, as time permits, because there is um, 27 board members and, of course, as you know, 10 EA directors. So we just got to plan it. Municipal part doesn't matter. Yeah, we just got to plan it. You can say that at the board meeting and we'll see what the other But yes, we're on track to do that. Yeah. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Are we now at the point where we need to have Mr. Perotti speak with us? Okay. Uh, does do, do we need to introduce him? Somebody want to? Or CFO Fox, this is your show. All right. Thank you, Chair Bass, for giving me that title. <laughs> My little great niece, she calls me the big boss, and her mom's the little boss, so I'll keep that title. <laughs> so uh, I want to welcome Mario Perotti from BDO. Uh, they were our selected auditors this year. Uh, KPMG was our auditors for the past number of years. So we've passed the torch on. And oh, sorry, I thought my microphone wasn't working. Um, and yeah, I, there's not much uh, for me to lead into. Uh, he's kind of got a, a little bit of a presentation he wants to run you through. And uh, I'll turn it over. If you're good with that. You're more than welcome to come on up here. Go over there, okay. There you are. Director ba or Chair Bass, I just wanted to point out, I do have copies of the budget schedule here, but I think what I'll do is I'll make the couple changes that we pointed out today. And if I could send it out uh, after that, that would be appreciated. That would be great. And it's nice to see you again, Mario. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be in front of the Finance Committee. And um, CAO Hildebrand and uh, Director or, or CFO Fox had um, suggested I come to this meeting Typically, when we come pre-audit, um, we would have come in, we would have done our preliminary plan procedures, interim audit procedures and all that. That's actually happening um, next week. Um, staffing challenges, as you know, um, here, staffing challenges on our end and um, gain access to KPMG's files delayed us, but we're still on track to have the audit completed on time. But um, I do have a slide deck to walk you through kind of what the audit planning process is, what our process will be to go through. But before I start, um, this is the first time that I'm in front of the finance committee and some of you are new to this role too. I just wanna start with, are there any burning questions that you have for me and we can kind of deal with them up front or talk about them through the presentation? Seems like you're good to go. Okay, perfect. So we are in the process of um, planning the audit for the Thompson-Nicola Regional District for the year ended December 31st, 
2022. The purpose of the meeting um, ahead of the audit is actually the chance for the board to um, engage through the finance committee, obviously, to engage with the auditor and make sure that you're satisfied with the areas that we're gonna be looking at. And one of the things that is kind of misleading in terms of you know, the auditor relationship, um, you know, management issues in RFP, management goes through the RFPs and then comes to you know, the board with recommendations. And you know, obviously the board will bet that and ensure that they're satisfied. It creates the impression that we are agents of management. We're not. The community charter clearly defines that we are um, agents of the board. And it is the board's responsibility to make sure that you're satisfied with the audit and I report to you while I report to the board through the finance committee. And so this is your chance to really have a say in what we're doing. When we come back in late April, early February to present the audit results, um, typically if it's um, finance committee's pleasure, I always ask to go in camera with the initial presentation of the audit results and that'd be with the committee. And the idea behind that is so that you have a chance to ask the questions that you may not want feel comfortable asking in a public setting um, and being on the record with. And the idea behind that is to ensure that there's that open and transparent relationship between BDO and the TNRD. And then ultimately we'll come to a public board meeting and present the final statements, but only after they've been vetted by the finance committee. And so our timelines are on the screen right now. And so today, it's February 2nd, we're presenting our audit planning report. Next week, um, the team will be here and we will be going through and developing our initial planning work. Um, the work that will be involved is to validate the processes, the controls that are in place to make sure that our understanding of how the financial systems are operating are, can, are, um, are, are there. And then based on that, that's where we start identifying our risks. And we're gonna do our risk assessments. And this is really a very important piece. And actually the Canadian auditing standards changed this year to make it an even more robust piece. And because we're a new auditor, I won't go into the differences between where it was before and now, but understand that we really have to have very strong documentation in our files in terms of where the highest areas of risk are and why we are doing certain procedures. The higher the risk area, the more work we do there, the lower the risk area, the less work we do. And so, you know, as, as an example, I'm not too worried about whether or not the BC Hydro bill is paid on a monthly basis. Fairly low risk transaction recurring, it's routine. Where we're going to get into some of the risks is looking at how are we dealing with um, the recognition of your property taxation? How are you recognizing all of your funding agreements and all the grants that you receive? How do we, how does ma senior management interact with the finances? Those are the areas where we'll be spending more time. And so that's what the purpose is for next week to allow us to make sure that we have enough knowledge to make those assessments. Um, but I'll talk about what my initial thoughts are in terms of the high risk areas in a few slides. We'll be coming back beginning on the week of March 27th, probably two weeks um, in the office and then um, looking in late April, early May to uh, clear the financial statements ahead of the May 15th deadline. And so the process will be, we'll complete our audit. We will be um, drafting the statements. That's part of our agreement this year. And then we'll vet them with management. They'll come to the finance committee. On the finance committee's recommendation, they go to the board for final approval in a public meeting. And so, Auditor's responsibility. We are responsible to work with management to um, have timely issuance of the financial statements. And we are responsible for testing and making sure that we gather enough evidence to support our audit opinion. Because we're going in and we're looking at um, your systems, your processes, we are also responsible to report any deficiencies in internal controls. Okay. Um, Deficiencies in internal controls, any areas for recommendations, we are required to provide that to um, the board through the finance committee. Um, management is responsible for preparing the financial statements and all of the underlying records. They're also responsible for making sure that there are um, sufficient internal controls to make sure that the statements are free from misstatement, whether by accident or on purpose through fraud. 
the board is responsible for ensuring that they are monitoring what management is doing to ensure that there is a system of internal controls and ultimately to approve the financial statements and make sure that you're happy with the work that we did. So that's the rules. Everybody has a role to play in this. And so now we jump into some of the specific items. Um, and I know that this is, you know, a topic that we probably don't want to talk about very much, but the auditor is responsible for um, looking for fraud. And it's important to remember that having an audit doesn't discharge the board's responsibilities um, over ensuring that there's no fraud in the financial records. But just because you can't rely on us as part of your duties doesn't mean that we don't look at it. And the audit standards are clear. We're responsible for planning the audit to make sure that the statements are free from misstatement, whether by accident or by fraud. And so we have to identify where we think it could happen. We have to do testing in that area to make sure that we're satisfied that we didn't identify any evidence of fraud. And um, if we do find evidence of potential fraud, we are required to identify it and elevate it. And the way that process would work is if we find, say, for example, a junior clerk is the one where we're like, we're not comfortable with some of these transactions and this is where it is, we would go to um, CFO Fox and work through it with them. If it is something at the CFO or the CAO level, we may come directly to the chair of the finance committee um, for it. Um, fortunately, in my career, 20 plus years doing this, in local government, we haven't had to do that, but I have had to do it not for profits where we go direct to the board and it's not a pleasant experience. So we hope to avoid that. But So how do we deal with fraud? As an auditor, we need to, again, everything is risk-based. So what we need to do is we look, we need to look at management's assessment on whether they feel that there's fraud in the organization. What's the process for management in terms of identifying fraud? And has there been any communication from management to the finance committee or the board regarding fraud? And what's management's communication to employees regarding business practices, ethical behaviors, and all that? Obviously, right now, we're in a position where this has been evolving. Um, it's very public in terms of where all of this is at based on the recommendations from the forensic report. So we know where um, the organization stands on it and what's happening and the changes that have been made. So what we will be doing is we'll be looking at validating against those changes and making sure that those are there. And a lot of those changes and those procedures that were introduced will likely be testing as part of our audit to make sure that yes, not only have they said that they've implemented it, but they've implemented it properly. And those will be the types of things that we're doing. Now for the 2022 year end, we are not currently aware of any issues of fraud um, within the TNRD, but I am required to ask the committee, do you have any concerns over fraud, whether you have suspected frauds or areas that you feel that we need to be looking at that we might not be aware of? Director Grenier. I just want to get on the record that you've reviewed the previous report. You considered the issues of that previous report and that is reflected in your audit process. Yes. <clears throat> Don't see anyone else. Director Stamers, no. Okay. So, again, we look at what are the most significant areas of risk um, that we have and what are our responses. And we've identified three to bring forward to the committee. It's not to say that these are the only risk areas, but I like to call these the big three. You know, and the first one is recognition of grant revenue, government transfer revenue, and, and I'll lump in because you're a regional district property taxation because that is more complicated than your typical municipality. So obviously we know that the accounting standards around these are complex and the funding agreements get more and more complex. I'm actually part of a committee that meets with Ministry of Municipal Affairs on a quarterly basis and we often talk about the funding agreements that are coming out and how do we make this easier for management to go in and not have to do as much work and reporting on it while maintaining transparency. So we do typical testing there. The other two areas though, I think are ones that are more targeted. And so the first is related party payments and great accounting term for us to talk about. But what this is, we're looking at transactions with senior management and transactions with board members. 
as well as companies that are owned through board members. And so we actually will go through and um, identify all of these. We use the disclosure statements for when you ran for, uh, for, the, for the electoral areas that you ran for um, board positions. And then we can get from the municipalities off their websites, um, the appointed directors, um, their packages as well. And so we will identify what companies are owned. And then through our um, computer audit software, we will comb the source data in your accounting systems and pull those transactions to see what we can identify. And then management override of controls. Um, this is one that we are required to look at. And I think that there's an appreciation for why this is a required area for all auditors. Senior management is in a, is in a position where they can um, commit fraud because they can circumvent the control system. So our job is to look at, okay, how could management circumvent the systems? and do testing in those areas. And again, you know, in, in the local government space, we're looking at things of how would senior management get money out of the organization? And so non-payroll type payments, expense reports, those are items that we're always um, looking to test. And we have a suite of tests that we call internally public perception procedures where, you know what, is are some of these ones that are they material? Are they significant enough that we need to worry about that the statements would be wrong? No, but we know what happens if some of these more sensitive items um, go public, that there are issues. This is why we look at them because materiality doesn't really come into play here. So those are the main, those are the big three um, risks that we've identified. The next slide talks about the concept of materiality. Materiality, um, $800,000. And the idea of this $800,000 that we've calculated is how big of an error could there be in the financial statements that would cause um, a rate payer or a funder to change how they view the TNRD. This number will be lower than um, what KPMG had last year because this is our first year audit. So we drop it from 3% of revenues down to 2% because this is our first year and we got to be a little bit more um, tight on it. But when we talk about errors, how big of an error could there be in all of that? Very simply put, materiality, I look at it as a scoping number. And when we talk about we can't test every transaction, we use statistical sampling to do our testing. Materiality guides how many transactions we need to look at to get um, a 95% confidence interval from our statistical modeling that we're satisfied there's no errors in the population. The other item that it's used for is that there are big estimates on your statements. So as an example, you operate landfills. Landfill, we get engineering reports, they come up with their numbers. We have to go through and critique it and go, okay, well, we think that it could be off by this. And so they come up with a number, we come up with a number, and then we compare the two in the context of materiality and say, is it close enough? Because really we're taking a number and projecting it 30, 40 years into the future no one's going to have the exact number right. So we use materiality as a guide for that. Doesn't mean that if it's under $800,000, we're not looking at it. This is a guide to guide us in how much testing and where our testing needs to be. So this slide talks a bit about our process and what we're doing. And I started by talking about, you know, we've done our initial scoping exercise where we figured out, okay, here's the financial statement areas that we need to audit. These are the types of transactions we have. Next week, we're gonna come in and we're gonna go, okay, if we know these are the 20 areas that we have to audit, where are the risks in these areas and where are we gonna be testing them? And then from that, we're gonna design our audit process and address how we're going to deal with these risks. That's where planning ends. Step four is where the end of March starts and we come in and we gather evidence to support this. And then we come in, form our opinion and come back with reporting. But because we haven't entered stage three yet, this is your chance as a board and um, to come to us and say, here's the areas that we feel you should do testing. And then we can make sure that we're factoring that in if you have any concerns. And so again, I'd like to pause and open it up to um, the committee. And do you have any areas of concern where you feel that you wanna make sure we have testing? Director Laird. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one of the things that this is a brand new committee, We've never had the opportunity to get this in depth into what you're talking about. Uh, prior to this, 
the previous auditor uh, would make a presentation and there was uh, there was some involvement the audit committee or the finance committee just strictly dealt with audit so a question like what you're asking this uh, committee right now um, we probably don't have enough information if we if we have a, any thoughts at all as to where it's going and the other thing that's really changed is um, after a forensic audit, huge changes. Everything's been completely tightened up. Um, I've been in local politics for 20 years, and I couldn't believe that uh, the, the previous audit did not pick up on some of the things that were happening on this board. And um, it's been completely changed, and I, it'll be uh, hopefully really difficult for any kind of fraud. Thank you. We're good. So I'm going to just take a step back because I, I do appreciate this is a new committee and everything has changed. Um, so I'm going to ask the question, though, because I do want to make sure that you've had a chance to have input because this is understanding that what we're doing today, this is not going to be the last time that you see me. And it might be that, you know, you will be see me as I've been speaking to CFO Fox at, at meetings that we don't talk about the financial statement audit. And so simply put, if we go and look at it, just the general finances of TNRD or areas where you're just looking at where you don't understand what's happening or you don't have a comfort level in, what types of areas, like when you get, if you were to get a report, would you feel those would be? Director Lear, anything? Anyone? Director Stamer, no? Okay. Sure, go ahead. Because we have a brand new CFO, and it's the first time of her being able to work with a financial committee like this, there are questions that we have that I don't think that will involve uh, just clarification on uh, what we've discussed about already today. And uh, I, at this time, I don't know how the rest of the committee feels. I, I can't see anything uh, maybe in two months. You know, we've, we've got a couple more meetings coming up. We might have some questions that we need clarification on, but I'm sure our, our CFO can more than make us uh, satisfied with any questions we have. CFO Fox? Uh, just to add in too, from what I've observed uh, over my time here, I think where the the comfort of the board is, where their oversight really comes in, is that compliance piece. And I think that the day-to-day -day financials, you know, you guys rely on the auditor to come in and spot check and make sure the finance is being accounted for appropriately. And then the compliance piece, you know, are, are the correct audit procedures happening? Are the right individuals uh, following the right levels of compliance to make sure that we're following the, the policies and the bylaws? Because it's not really a a strong oversight. If, if you don't follow a bylaw, if it's not directly exposed, you don't really see that. So bringing that other level of compliance in there, I think will help as well, where the board maybe not having a, a great understanding of the questions to ask at that this time. So just thought I'd throw that piece out there. No, absolutely. And actually you do bring up a good point that, you know, um, and be careful how I word this because I'm going to speak about your previous auditor. And um, when it comes to auditing, there are different ways that you we have various different types of tests that we can go in. We can do tests of detail where I take my most junior staff and I go, here's the 200 transactions that you need to find. Go stick your head in the filing cabinet, find me those invoices and come up for air when it's all done. That's the one type of testing we can do. Another type of testing that's available is um, we do analytical procedures. So we form an expectations, we look at relationships and we go, okay, based on our expectations of um, your budgets, based on what we know has happened in the year, we can go and do analytical and go, does this make sense? And we inquire, we corroborate evidence and we can do that sort of thing. Or we can do tests of compliance. Um, a test of compliance is where we're looking to your procedures and we're relying on your controls to say that, yes, if they're following this, these processes and we've validated that they're being followed, that we're not, that 
there won't be um, misstatements in there. Obviously, an audit's going to need elements of all three of those. I can say that your previous auditor, um, their approach typically is more towards where they lean more heavily on the analytical work. That's just their approach um, as a firm. That's fine. They gather their evidence. They do it that way. Um, my approach, especially in the local government um, arena, is that we look to TESA compliance as the primary um, source of evidence because we feel that this is um, you know, an area where we need to make sure that things are flowing through and especially in certain areas where there's most sensitive, that's what we do. And you know, one of my partners in the Vancouver office came from you know, uh, KPMG in the past. And that was something that him and I will, um, because he's in the local government space as well, and when I'm having my team meetings and, you know, chairing those meetings, we get into it about, well, we're not doing enough analytical. And I go, well, this is why, you know, our direction is to do compliance. And so that's something that we've been developing over the years. So give you a bit more of a flavor in type, terms of the type of testing that we're doing as well. Director Thorpe. I'm glad to hear about the compliance. I'm brand new, but Scott and I've had a couple of discussions I seem to recall around something that happened that I think if compliance had been looked at more closely, it wouldn't have. And so, yeah, if I had any direction, for lack of a better word, I'd be happy to see it go in the compliance direction. But thank you. Okay. And, and I'll kind of pause and, and move away from the audit at this point and also, you know, talk about one of the recommendations um, that was in um, my forensic team's report. And that talked about um, the need for an internal auditor to be here. And, you know, with your previous CFO and speaking with your new CFO, what we talked about and the way we positioned it in our proposal, you know, we understand that, you know, the report and the forensic team, they're going to go, here are the best practices blanket, right? But acknowledging that having an internal auditor at $150,000 a year or whatever you would pay them, doesn't make sense for an organization of this size. And so one of the ways has been talked about to discharge um, that recommendation is we've built into our proposal that we will do what's called an internal audit light. And so the way I've done this with other organizations is that this would be when we come in next year, when we do our interim audit, it'll be in the fall, just with the transition. It's happening later than we normally would this year. We would identify here's the areas where you want an internal audit done. It could be on landfill. It could be on revenue collection. It could be on payroll. And we would communicate um, you know, through the CFO to the finance committee on what areas to look at. Later in the summer, we've had a chance to digest. And then when we come in in the fall, um, we would have our internal audit partner direct our staff um, locally to go, okay, this is the area that we're looking at. Here's the plan for the internal audit. And here's the report that would come back to the finance committee. So we found that as a cost-effective way to kind of deal with that um, recommendation as well. So that will be coming through the summer and into the fall as well. Okay. So the next slide, just to before open it up for any other questions, um, we talked about this new risk model and the way the auditing standards have changed. And so what's happening, and again, I'm bringing this up not because of to give you contrast to what's happened in the past, but for you to understand what we're doing, the risk assessment and, and really thinking about how we can find errors has they put a lot more pressure. This is CPA Canada and the international um, standard setters to say that as an auditor, you really need to identify risks and target your procedures to risks. And this is in response to a lot of the accounting failures that have been happening in um, Europe and the UK, Carillion, um, if you've heard of that, was a major example about four years ago that happened. And so these standards have been developed in response to those failures. And so the idea behind it is we're going to spend a lot more work on identifying risks and the related controls within the organization and then looking at each risk and going, okay, is it risky because it's a complex area? Is it risky because management's inclined to manipulate it or has bias to manipulate it? Or is it just a big number and we got to be careful because if one goes wrong, it's going to cause a big issue. And so we have to look at all of that, really take a hard look at your systems of internal controls, which we've been doing in the past, but I think it's good that now it's codified what we've been doing. 
And then um, it also has an expanded focus on technology, looking at your systems in a digital world and making sure that we're actually going in and um, and ensuring that there aren't risks in the statement due to um, technology. And then at the end, we stand back and it's like grade 10 math. When you have those word problems, did we show our work to get full marks for what we did? And can somebody who's a reasonable auditor come and see my thought process on why we're approaching things the way we did? And it's really, and having to document that, I think really puts a lot more transparency in our process for our staff understanding why we're doing it, uh, why we do these tests. Um, so I think it's a positive for our industry. And so with that, um, I'll leave the rest of the slides for you to go through on your own, but these are the key items that I wanted to address with you today. So again, I'll pause any questions for me. Judge Penny. Uh, just uh, if you could enlighten me, your engagement is how much and is your engagement at the end just limited to your opinion or are you going to be providing uh, uh, recommendations uh, that carry on from the from the previous forensic audit? Okay, so our engagement is a standalone engagement on the audit uh, of the uh, financial statements of the TNRD. Um, the audit fees for the audit of the TNRD are just, we're in here. I don't have the hospital district, which I believe is about another 7,000, 34,000 for the TNRD and then 7,000 additional roughly for the hospital district. Um, as an auditor, um, we have to look at the, the forensic audit, and, and I should be clear, um, even though it was BDO performing the audit, very early in the process, I recused myself from it and get, and let the team out of Vancouver have full autonomy. And that was done purposely. Um, you know, the city of council is a, is a client of mine. A, you know, if um, Councillor Bass was what was found that there were some transactions that implicated her, it, none of that happened. But if I was involved, then it could compromise our objectivity. So early on, I was separated from that. But it's important to know that that was a very separate engagement to this. So while the recommendations that came out of it are going to factor into our risk assessment and our planning, um, our reporting to you is on the financial statements. And we're required that if we do find areas of noncompliance or deficiency where you've you've made it one of these recommendations um, you've implemented, but it's not sufficient, we're required to bring that forward to you. Anyone else? Looks like we're good. Thank you. Thank you. I gotta say, having been on TNRD for four, four years before this, I finally am starting to understand all this stuff between you and, uh, and CFO Fox. Uh, it's much clearer because I don't have a, an analytical mind when it comes to finances. So thank you for everything. And thank you too. Uh, yes, CFO Fox. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to add, coming in as a new CFO, looking at the TNRD, of course, making a decision to come on to the TNRD in in the time that it was, you know, you could think that that would be difficult. But from my history and my perspective, I think from the outside looking in, sometimes we always look at it a little bit differently. So I just wanted to share that from my perspective, coming in and working with the finance team here, they are, they're a solid team. They're one of the best, strongest teams that I've worked with. They have a long tenure. They, they work extremely well together. The day-to-day -to -day financials are, are being done like any other organization. The, the leadership and the support that we give that team and the compliance that we follow is extremely important to making sure that that team can do their, their jobs. So I think from my perspective, bringing in this other layer, working with Mario, having this change, the timing of BDO coming in uh, for this audit, I think is really significant. I think we've got somebody who has really a wide uh, knowledge and experience with local government and the different levels, because you talk about compliance in a business, it's much different than compliance in a local government. They're, 
There's a board and what motivates the board and board compliance. There's senior level management and policy compliance. And then there's following all the financial standards and the legislation. Uh, it's, it's very complex. And we need somebody with that, that broad look, not that the others don't have it. I just know um, from experience, uh, Mario's background in it. And I think it's gonna be a real strength to the board and to us. And it's, it's our job to work with them and to take their recommendations and just work off what we're doing, which isn't always perfect. But I think uh, I'm pretty confident uh, in the team and the work that we're doing at that level. From my perspective, we have to be good, good leaders and uh, set the stage and support them where they need it. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. I think we're done with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mario. Don't we? We've moved on to new business. Any new business from anyone? I think I'll start. Uh, just to explain how I run meetings, because um, I can be a little rigid. Um, <laughs> Uh, if if I see someone who's dominating conversation and there are other people waiting, I will go away from that person and go over to other people, other people, and then go back. And I I like to, I like to see the question. I don't want to. I, I I understand there can be a lot of discussion, and I, and that's good, especially with finance. But um, I'm and maybe I'm being heavily influenced by the Tuesday uh, council meeting we had, where sometimes it took forever to get to the question. Um, I just would tell you that that's sort of how I like things to go. If it becomes a problem for anyone, please tell me. Um, because I know with finance, we have to be a little more lenient in our timing and understanding, especially me. Uh, so that's that's my only new business. Anybody else? Nope. Motion to adjourn. We're adjourned. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. See you, Ward. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.